Lighthouse Church presents the following message by Pastor Jason Holloman. Okay, well, good. For, turn with me to 1 John. Turn with me to 1 John. Uh, 1 John, now this is important. Uh, so the death of Jesus is right around AD 33. And so John, uh, who is known as, and 2 John and 3 John as the elder. Uh, John, this is the guy that, that Jesus really loved, right? So he was kind of like the one, right? He had the 72. Well, he had the 5,000. Jesus had the 72. He had the 12, the 12 disciples, right? And then he had the three that he was really close with. And then he had the one that he just super loved. And that was John. And, and of all the disciples, he was the only one that wasn't killed uh, as a martyr uh, of all the 12 disciples. And so we have very good uh, indication through church history of where these guys uh, died and how they died. And, uh, and it's important. It's part of the evidence for the faith. So if you go, ah, I'm not sure I believe in this. I'm not sure I care about this. I mean, it wasn't really that big of a deal. It was a big deal. These guys were uneducated guys that scattered like crazy at the death of Jesus. But when they saw the risen Jesus, these guys, every one of them unto their death, went to death believing and heralding the gospel. Now, why? Why? <clears throat> well, because what fear do you have of death if you saw the guy that's preceding you in death resurrected? Amen. Like, you're not going to be afraid. You're going to be like, oh, yeah, I'll go to death. But we saw Jesus go to death. But then we saw him resurrected, right? They just walked in unbelievable faith. Now, the reason I mention this is this is John, right? This is John the Beloved. And so he's an apostle, and he's an elder, like I said, in 2nd and 3rd John. And so we, we know that he died probably around 88 years old, probably born in 11, uh, that is A.D. 11, probably died in A.D. 99. This, this work here was written in A.D. 90, right? So he's, he's a super old guy at this point. No offense for some of you that are in that age group, but he's old, okay? Now, just for context, he writes the book of Revelation probably in 95, 96, so three years before his death, so right about 84 or 85 years old, he writes the last book of our New Testament, which is Revelation. And so, and so this is a pretty old book as far as what, when it was written. And it's about 60 years. It was written about 60 years, 57 years after the death of Jesus. Now, the reason why I think that's important is because when we jump in this, we're going to jump right into this, and when we do, you'll see that he's talking like he's an old guy, and he's talking like he's one of the few eyewitnesses. Like he talks like that. And so you're like, okay, well, why is that a big deal? Well, the timeline makes it a big deal. Because it's very likely that at this point when he's writing this, there is no other apostles left. That is to say, the 12, the 12 disciples, none of them are left. They've all been martyred or killed. It's very, very likely that he alone is the last of the 12 apostles. And so when he's writing these letters in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, we... We, we call them epistles, these letters, then it kind of takes a different flavor, if you will. It's just a little bit different. And by the time he writes Revelation, you get the sense that he's, you know, advanced in years and then on the island of Patmos, no more. And then the gospel continues to advance. Now, again, we see the Apostle Paul uh, later in that. We're not going to get to that. When we get to maybe the book of Philemon um, uh, this fall, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the history of, of the Apostle Paul and why he's the misplaced apostle and things like that. For those of you that are not like super into studying your Bibles, we want to make it easy, right? I mean, I, we hope that everybody would be super into studying your Bible, but it's not everybody's gig. I get it. And, uh, and so it's important that we see the context here. Now, 1 John, why are these letters written? Why is 1 John written? Well, it's written because there's some things going on in the church. And so most of the letters that we have are written for very specific reasons. And so it, it's not just like, hey, just thought I'd say hi. No, to write a letter at this age is a significant deal. Like, you're not just going to be like, hey, like, like, for instance, today, email means nothing, right? Like, you can send an email about whatever. And then it just, you just push send, and it's, it means it's literally, the barrier of entry for it is, is very, very low. But today, when you go to write a letter, it's like, it better be for a reason, right? Like, if a buddy of yours writes you a letter, it's like, oh, gosh, what's happening? Right? At least that's for me. Like, if I get a letter in the mail, I'm like, if it's not around late February, which is my birthday, then why, why is so-and-so writing me, right? Well, so he, he, John the Beloved, man, he's writing for a reason. He is specifically speaking to something that's going on 
with this unnamed congregation. We know that it's very likely he wrote this uh, uh, from Ephesus, and he likely wrote it to a church or to many churches in Turkey. Now, remember, we're going through 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. 2nd and 3rd John were written to individual people, whereas this letter, 1st John, is likely written to a church or a, a group of churches, a collection of churches. Now, I'm going to read all the way through our passage for today, which is 1 John uh, 1, 1 through 10, and then we'll jump into our text. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest. And we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. Verse 3, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Verse 5, And this is the message that we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and The blood of Jesus and his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Church, let's pray after the reading of our passage. Father, we submit this passage of Scripture. It's, it's living, it's active, it's sharper than a two-edged sword. It cuts between the joint of bone and marrow. It is living. It, it is for us today. It's written to this church, but it's for us. It's, it's written to them for us today. It is as practical today as it was the day it was penned by John through the inspiration of the Spirit. And so we ask that you would even now begin to soften our hearts as a result of the reading of the Word. We pray that we would not result to task lists or naps or just rest from the weariness of what life looks like for so many today. We pray that this would be a moment that we could just enjoy the sacredness of God's people, the worship of God, and God's word. So help us today, we pray. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, if you look at the way that this begins, at the very beginning, uh, this is a grammatical not. This is what commentators call the first three verses of this section. It is like a grammatical not that is just a total mess to try to understand. Like the connecting, the connecting, um, Uh, subject and verb, don't even begin to manifest in this sentence until verse 3. And so thank God we have really good um, folks to translate this for us, because if this were in the original Greek, this would just be a total mess. It would feel a lot like the song we just sang, you know, it has really odd cadence, which is part of what I messed up in the singing. And it's just like, you're like, oh gosh, do I I say this now, or do I say it differently? It's it's just really, really unique, and we have that here. Uh, Verse 1, and which was from the beginning, that which was from the beginning, which was heard, which was seen with our eyes, and we looked upon, and that we touched. Notice, notice how earthy this is. This is really fun, because this is right about the time that Gnosticism starts. Gnosticism is the idea that, uh, that this, what is spiritual is really good, <clears throat> and then what is physical is really bad. <clears throat> and so what you have here is, th- this is right at the beginning of like kind of a, a second century, so 100 on, um, a heresy that, that began to get into the church. There's just this heresy that's like, oh, no, you don't want to do anything physical. Physical is super, super bad, yet not to mention the fact that Jesus came 
in human form, in the flesh. So you can see why there would be a demonic opposition to the idea, why Gnosticism was so powerful. But even now, you see this idea where you see, like, what we have heard with our ears, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have touched was made manifest. It's powerful. Now, so I, I don't know what you did in high school. I don't know what was fun for you guys. For me, what was fun for us in high school was also a necessity, and that was we had to work on our cars. So like literally at the, like, like I don't know, maybe you guys had great cars. We had cars that we prayed and worked on all year just to pass inspection. Like, I mean, that was, that was a whole goal for the remainder of the year is that in April, like I, mine was in April, like I, there was a Jeep in particular, when I worked the entire year, oh God in heaven, may this thing be ready for April next year, right? And we'd you know, have to do something that's like, well, you don't have, you know, you don't have windshield wipers. I was like, I will by April, you know? <laughs> well, you know, your tires are looking pretty rough. I was like, I'll get them fixed before April, right? And it was that kind of thing all the time. And I mean, I cannot tell you. So me and my friends, we would always just be working on our cars, and there was a particular friend, and, uh, and we'll just leave his name nameless because it's not a very becoming story of him, but he was, uh, his dad was a mad scientist, super engineer, multiple PhD, uh, worked on transistors and things like that, and so he always had the neatest, oh, I, I keep remembering, this is so fun, we, I have my old Sunday school teacher in here, so she will know who this family is, so we'll need to be careful here, and, uh, and so literally, we would go to his house because his dad had all the tools, they had all the things, and so... And this buddy of mine, we'll just call him Dave, Dave would, he was the guy that had to touch things and smell things and, and, and taste things. And we, would, we had this thing, like we were working on our cars. Uh, his car was called El Bondo because it had so much Bondo around it. And so do you know what Bondo is? Okay, this is very important. If you do not know what Bondo is, raise your hand. Okay. Okay, good. That, man, guys, I actually fell deeper in love with you. Like, I don't even know how that's possible. Like, literally, my heart just went, oh. Like, I fell deeper in love with all of you. Yes, Bondo is hole filler for cars. Like, if you have a hole in your car, you fill it with Bondo. His car name was El Bondo. Okay, do you see it? Do you see it? So we were working on some stuff, and somehow a wrench went into the side of his car one more time, and so we had to patch it up. And so at this point, you know, he's always wanting to touch and feel and smell, and he was mixing Bondo, and I would always say, Dave, don't try that. Because he just was the guy that had to feel and touch, and he's an engineer, he's an engineer today. I mean, engineers are kind of strange. I mean, you guys know, right? You, you, I mean, you know, they're just, they're just a little different. They kind of want to, you know, feel it. And I'm telling you, he was mixing this stuff, and just, he would always just kind of look around and be like, just putting his nose in it and smelling it. And I mean, I was working on some part of his car, a tie rod, I think, and all of a sudden, something just came over me, protect your friend. And I just, I just like, I turn around, and he was just about to eat some of this bondo. And I said, Dave, put the bondo down. You cannot just eat to see what something is like. This is weird. You're never going to be married. You're never going to be married. Now, listen, this is important. Now, why does he do that? He does that because he wants to understand it. He wants to experience it. Like, he's, he smells stuff, right? So, again, he was just up. This is the grossest smelling thing you've ever smelt in your life. What would Dave say? I'll smell it. I'd, like, I'd actually like to get a good deep whiff of that. Yeah. <laughs> Most disgusting? Yes, please. Right? That's Dave. Well, this, look, look at the descriptors here that we have touched with our hands. Look at the descriptors that we have heard, that we have seen with our own eyes. This was made manifest. This is John talking. Like John, John like sat next to Jesus, right? Like, like John saw, like doubting Thomas, right? When Jesus was in glorified form, he, he comes in and says, look at the scars in my hands. And you get the sense that Thomas, probably even John, were like, all right, yeah, come on. Wow, yeah, yeah. And, and the, the whole idea of this, the term manifest is literally to, to take what is hidden or misunderstood or not known and to bring it to form. So what is invisible to visible form. And life was made manifest. And we have seen it. And we testify to it and proclaim to you 
the eternal life which was from the Father was made manifest to us. Now, we, we can turn to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, uh, God created, right? We could go to Colossians chapter 1, right? We, we could see all of these, this big, grand idea. From the very beginning, this was the main thing. And that's what John's getting at here with this letter. Again, this is, this is at the end of his life. And so he's writing of greatest importance. And so you get this, you get this sense that like... Uh, in fact, I was, I was laughing yesterday because I was on the phone with Daniel and Chris and we were talking about how old men talk to each other. It's kind of a fun thing to watch, right? It's just, just like two dudes that are just super long-term relationships sitting on a porch looking out. They don't say a whole lot, right? Often they don't. And the gap between what they say is really long. The pauses are scary, but man, you see a bunch of young dudes together, they, they are both talking at the same time. Not listening, neither of them, just talking. You know, talk, 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 right? Right? And then, and then as they get older and older, he, at the place where he is, he's writing of greatest importance here. And what does he say? <clears throat> that that we, which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you so that you may have fellowship with us. Fellowship. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father, with the Son, Jesus Christ. Often we get the question, uh, or I get the question all the time, yeah, so God made man, uh, he made men and women because God was lonely, right? That's why, he was, that's why he did it. It's like, oh, friend, no, no, God has existed with himself in the person of Father, Son, and Spirit forever, and there is no loneliness in God. He, he doesn't need us. Like, you know, he isn't up there cosmically like, oh, gosh, I really wish I had something to do. Like, I would, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to create humanity because that's a good idea. Like, no, that's what he, didn't do. he doesn't do that. He has always coexisted in Trinitarian form. So the very heart of God is the community and fellowship of God. And so when Jesus enters the earth, when he is sent, then he immediately begins to commune with those because why? He's always existed in community. So Jesus doesn't enter the earth as a lone ranger. He enters the earth communally. In, in fact, that, that's one of the marks of a Christian is that we exist communally. It's, it's a distinction. So when people say, hey, can you be a Christian by yourself? You know what I would say? I was like, yeah, for a few minutes, for a few days, for a few months. But it is, it is never a part of the plan. It has never been a part of the plan. From the beginning, for the Christian to be solo isolated, individualist, individualistic. We get this idea, it's like, no, man, I need to go to the woods and, and I can just live by myself and, and I'm, I'm, I can just live like a, a Christian. All these things, like, how can you even be a Christian? I mean, how can you love one another when you're by yourself? How can you be patient with one another by yourself? How, how can you grow in, in grace by yourself? You can't, it doesn't work. Verse four, and we're writing these things so that our joy may be complete. And this is the message, verse five, that we have heard from him. Again, you get this picture of him being this last apostle and proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Now, <clears throat> there's this fantastic quote um, uh, in the Cambridge Commentary series. And this is the quote. There are three statements in the Bible which stand alone as revelations of the nature of God. They are all in the writings of John. God is spirit. So this is John 4. God is light. And God is love. These are monumentous statements. And they predicate no article whether definite or indefinite. So there's no definite or indefinite article. He is A or he is the, right? <clears throat> we are not told that God is the spirit or is the light or the love or that he is a spirit or a light, but we are told that God is spirit, is light, is love. They are probably the nearest approach to a definition of who God is that the human mind can comprehensive, that can comprehend. And the history of thought and religion are unique. 
Now, the more we consider him, they satisfy us. The simplest intellect can understand its meaning, and the most subtle and the most subtle look at his nature cannot exhaust it. Now, these are not attributes like mercy, goodness. These are literally, this is literally what he is. Now, this is fun because when we look at this idea of light, we're going to connect this idea. John here connects this idea of light with truth. He connects it with truth. How do I know? Well, keep reading. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus. His son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And so what you see is he's beginning to connect both in verse 8 and in verse 6, this idea in verse 5 that God being light means that God is always true. So there's this idea. So have you heard the concept where when a president, we'll leave all the names out of it, but when a president just says something that, that it can become law, right? It can become law. So he's in, in essence, because he is the chief executive, he is in, in part um, the one who is above the law. There's this idea that he, he can't actually break the law because he can, he can pardon from the law. There's this idea that he is, if you will, just otherly different. And so God himself is the same, except on a much larger scale. So when God says something, it's just true. There is no division in him. And if he was to say something, you ready for your mind to be blown? If he was to say something that wasn't true, it would immediately become true. Why? Because he said it. Now, you might think, oh, come on, that's weird. It's like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. That's literally what it, that's a part of the definition of God. If God was to say something that originally was untrue, just by merely saying it makes it foundationally factual. He is truth. And what he says is true. He is good. He is love. He is, as John says, light. Now, this is, becomes critical for us because there's two warnings for us in here. And again, I love to tell you, there's no reason to make these warnings less warning. I want these warnings, I want these warnings to feel like a warning, right? In fact, just the other day, I was staring at one of my sons, nameless, staring at one of my sons. I was like, do I need to tell you how serious I am? No. It's like, okay. Do you believe me? Yes. It's like, I don't believe you believe me, right? And so if, if I... Like a good dad, I'm trying to tell my sons how serious I am, or my children how serious I am in certain things, then I would be not a good very, I would not be a very good preacher or pastor for a warning to feel softer than it is. Now, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son cleanses us from sin. Often this passage, I hear this passage misquoted all the time all the time, and, and I hear it said this way, but if we walk in the light as he's in light and we have fellowship, then the blood of Jesus. There is no then. This isn't an if-then statement. This is an and statement. It's adding to it. And so you don't, you don't get Jesus because you have fellowship, or you don't get Jesus when you walk in the light. No, the idea here is a test. So there's a test here for non believer. So people ask, how do you know if a person's a Christian? Like, how do you know? How do you know? I'll say, well, there's the belief. There's truth. There's this idea that you, you have to, you walk in the truth, the truth of Jesus. That's one of the tests. Well, 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 that's another test. Obedience. Like, does this person follow the scriptures? Do they just have a desire to follow the scriptures? And then thirdly, love. Is that person loving? Now, I'll tell you why the test works. Like Lucifer, we call bright morning star, Satan by other names. He, he knows the truth. He literally does. His Christology, understanding of Christ, is better than ours. I'm telling you, it is. So, that, so just knowledge of the truth, that is not a good enough test. That's not a test. It doesn't work, right? Like, so a test for marriage, to know something about your spouse. Well, parents, parents know something about your spouse. Like, their parents know something about your spouse. A lot, maybe even more at, at the beginning. So knowledge alone is not a good test. Well, what's a second Obedience. Do you desire to follow the scriptures? Do you have a desire to, to do what the Bible says to do? Do you have a desire for that? Lucifer doesn't have a desire to do that. Not at all. No, he wants to do what is contrary to the scriptures. Okay, so we're getting closer in our test. And then lastly, love. 
Lucifer doesn't do things out of love. Lucifer does things out of hatred, right? Lucifer hates humanity. Why? We're made in God's image. Like in his image, we are created. Like we are put above the angels. I would be upset too. And so there's a, there's a test here. And so what's the test? If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So already we're starting to get kind of an idea of what might be happening in this church, right? So you get a sense that, that John's writing because he's hearing stories. He's like, man, what's happening in this church? People are probably saying, man, I'm not sinful. I'm not sinning. Oh, come on, that's not sin. I mean, what? I mean, listen, look, Jesus died on the cross. Everything's great, we're good. Everything's fine, right? And what is he saying? He's saying, no, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, verse nine, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, there's this idea that, there's this idea that we, we must confess. It's interesting, I, I find that so often we try to, to hold on so, uh, so tightly to things that we have to do. So, uh, so what, when I walk with a new believer and they say, so I have to go to church, right? It's like, no, you don't have to go to church. No, no, I have to, I'm a Christian now. I gotta go to church, right? I have to go to church. It's like, you don't have to go to church. You get to go to church. And it's like, no, man, church is a have to, right? It's like, no, man, it's not a have to. I don't know how to tell you this. You know, it's like, it's a privilege, it's fun. It's worshipful. It's like soul giving, right? And it's like, okay, so you're telling me I have to. Right, I hear the same thing about confession. Okay, now I'm a Christian, I gotta confess. It's like, no, you get to. You get to confess. It's a privilege. It's amazing. Like, I mean, in fact, to, to prove the point, to prove the point, uh, Psalm 32, beginning in verse three. Psalm 32 says this. Beginning in verse, yeah, beginning in verse one. Blessed in the, is the one whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I slept, my bones wasted away. Through my groaning all day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me until my strength was dried up as by the heat of the summer. Uh, of the summer. What, what is David saying here? He's like, man, when I didn't confess my sin, I was being literally sapped of strength. In fact, I often will say this. In fact, let's read one more passage. Proverbs 28, 13. Proverbs 28, 13 uh, says similarly. Verse 13, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Blessed is the one who fears the Lord always, but whoever hardens his heart will fall into calamity. It's so interesting that you see very clearly here. In fact, often when somebody will come in and they'll say, hey man, I just feel exhausted. I'm like, what do you feel exhausted about? I feel exhausted spiritually. Well, how do you feel exhausted spiritually? Well, because of this, this, and this. And one of my first questions, one of my first questions, do you have any unconfessed sin? Do you have any unconfessed sin? Oh man, bro, I, was, I, I thought you were gonna tell me to take a nap. You know, it's like, no, 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 I'm asking the question. And they'll immediately say, why are you getting in my business? Why are you getting into my business? And I'll say, well, actually, you brought your business to me. So, you brought your business to me? Now I'm in your business. Do you have any unconfessed sin? Come on, man, Jesus saved me. I was like, I believe that. Totally believe that. Well, then what, why do I have to confess it? Because the Bible says it will dry up your strength. That's why. Oh, so you tell me I have to confess? Once again, I'm telling you, you get to. It's a privilege. It's a joy. And listen, the worst, the worst thing is when you look around the room or you look around your social circles or you look around the area that you hang out with and you go, there's nobody I can talk to. That's the worst thing. That, I feel terrible for those people. In fact, often when peer, people come in, I'll say, hey, do you have any unconfessed sin? They'll say, oh man, you're gonna tell everybody? I was like, do you think a pastor stays a pastor very long? 
telling everybody's junk on the street. It doesn't work. That pastor's gone in a year. I've lived in these counties my whole life. I ain't leaving these counties. You got to hear me, seriously. No, I'm not telling you so you can tell yourself. I'm telling you that if you feel dry, if you feel, if you feel spiritually heavy, one of the first questions we can ask is, man, man, Lord, what are you, what's going on in my heart? What's, is there something that I need to confess? Because you get to. It's a privilege. We see this. Now, Martin Luther says, oh, excuse me, no, this is Spurgeon. Ah, Spurgeon says this. It is not the nature of sin to remain in a fixed state. Like decaying fruit, it grows more and more rotten. The man who is bad today will be worse tomorrow. Now, he's not saying that they're going to lose salvation because that cannot be the case. What Spurgeon is getting at here is this, that there is this idea in the heart of men and women. There's this idea that like worship, like reading of God's word, like communion with the saints, confession is a blessing, and it's not a have to. Now, somebody in this church likely was saying, oh, man, I ain't got no sin. I'm done. Done, no sin. Me and my, my wife, oh, wait, we're great. We're perfect. Oh, we're not sinning against each other at all. Huh? Mm. Parenting? Oh, I'm doing great. Everything's great. No problems with parenting here. Mm-mm. No, look at my kids. Look at my kids, right? Perfect. Perfect kids, right? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I love it. It's so fun. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Please see the warnings in 8 and 10. Now, what does it mean to make God a liar? It's blasphemy. It's pretty powerful, right? So we're not talking about pagan, like a pagan uh, who's just like, oh, man, I don't care about God. I'm going to do whatever I want. No, blasphemy is different. Blasphemy is, is actually speaking against something that God says or speaking against something that is holy. Blasphemy is an altogether different thing. And so, it's, again, it's one thing if you just want to live like a pagan, and you're just like, hey, uh, say la vie, live and let die, whatever's good for the stomach. I'm in, totally in. That's paganism, right? That's not blasphemy. Blasphemy is saying, God didn't say this. That's blasphemy. Blasphemy is saying, God doesn't care about that when he does. It's an altogether different thing. And that's, that's what's happening here. You make God a liar when you say you have no sin. It's significant. Now, if you feel that weight, good, because man, I have, as I've been reading this, oh God in heaven, what am I saying is unholy that you call holy? Or what am I saying is holy that you call unholy? Like, in what way does my life reflect not holding sacred the things that you hold sacred? Those are important questions for a believer as we begin to kind of, if you will, look like the image of Jesus. Now, there's a couple of areas here that I, I just think are so fun. And one of them uh, is this quote by George Truett. He's a famous Baptist, don't, don't hate me, he's a famous Baptist preacher from around uh, 1900. And uh, in fact, actually, one of my son's middle name, Truett, is named after him, right? So George Truett, this evangelist. And uh, George Truett says this, and it's a powerful line. Uh, if one not be a sinner, then for him... There is no Savior. There's never a moment that we graduate from the need of the cross. We don't graduate from it. There's never a point that we, don't grad, we graduate from the need for God's word. I love this. So it's like, if you have a Bible, uh, anybody read through the Bible all the way through in a year or um, over a year? Okay, a couple of us, great. <clears throat> so like when you finish your Bible and it's like, you, write, you finish the Bible and it's like, <sighs> That was nice. I'm so, glad, I'm so glad we did that together. Yeah. And then you take the Bible and you go, I, well, let's, where's the next book I'm going to read every day? And you put it on your shelf and you're done with it? No, you don't graduate from your need for the Bible. Like you don't read the whole thing and go, oh, I'm so glad I finished that. Right? Let's go to the next religion or whatever. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. We don't graduate from our need of God's word. We don't graduate from our need 
of the community of the saints. You can't walk with like saints for 10 years ago. Oh man, that was so good. 10 years, love it. See ya. That was super great. Gonna go find some new people. You don't graduate from your need of the saints. We, we don't graduate from our need of, of worship. We don't graduate. We can't go and get maximum worship for like, for like an entire weekend and be like, man, I am up to here in worship. It's all I need. I'm just good. I'm good. It's as foolish as saying, I ate a lot of food yesterday. I'm probably great for 2023. <laughs> like, you should see how much Chick-fil-A I put in my stomach. There is no way that this amount of food is not going to carry me all the way through to the end of December. No, every one of you would be like, it doesn't work that way, bro. I can't, I'm going to keep going. By design, I'm keep going. I can't really stretch good at 16 years old and say, that'll probably last me until mid-70s. <laughs> like, nobody's stretched that deep ever. Did you see what I did with my leg? I'm sure that when I fall at 77 years old, I'm going to be like, I am so thankful I stretched at 16. God help me. Had I not done that, I don't know where I'd be. I don't know where I'd be. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. Confession is no different. Confession is no different. So I'm not putting legalism on you. I'm, I'm, I'm offering to you the joys of the Christian life. They're treasures. It's amazing. It's amazing. So now, in, in application, what, what, what do Christians, how do Christians walk? Well, I'll tell you. Christians walk openly about what is internal. That's what Christians do. Like the reason why I like to like make the joke about marriage and, and family and that sort of thing is all by design. Like I'm, what good is that gonna do anything if I say, oh yeah, everything's great. Don't look in here. Mm-mm. Nope, don't look at what uh, Holloman's thinking. Or nope, Holloman has no problems. You wanna have victorious Christian life? Hang out with us. No, it doesn't work. No, Christians walk openly about what's internal. The world wants to keep internal things internal. The world does not want to talk about what's going on in the heart and in the mind. No, Christians walk openly with those things. Secondly, Christians walk in communal lives when the whole world wants very tall fences, right? Like, like there used to be this, this uh, in fact, there's a wonderful book that was written a number of years ago, uh, Bobo's in Paradise, and, and in the book, this New York Times reporter says that it used to be that you could have these front porches and everybody's walking by and you see people and you're in a community in these neighborhoods and it's wonderful. And, and then around the 50s, it started to change where people started wanting to sit on their back porch, right? And then and remember, we used to have chain link fences and you could see right over and it was like, hey, Bill, you know, it's like, hey, John, how are you, right? It's like soccer balls are flying everywhere, you know, just it used to be that way. And then all of a sudden, around the 50s, 60s, you see this idea, this concept of moving from the front porch to the back porch, and then back porches became more isolated. Fences got taller, right? Instead of communal pools, everybody has their own pool, and instead of this, everybody has this, and, and you start to just get more and more and more isolated, except for very intentional windows that you let people in. Hey, everybody come over for this period of time, at this time, and then never come to my house again outside of this time. I love my neighbors. I love my neighbors for 45 minutes on the first Sunday on the odd years. <clears throat> it's just it's the strangest thing. It's the strangest thing. No, Christians live in a communal environment when the world wants to be segmented, fragmented, privatized. Everything is so private. It's so private. In fact, I tried to find a reason to talk to my neighbors. So all my neighbors, it's so fun. If I say, hey, let's get some lunch. Nope, nope, not interested. Like, okay, great. Hey, can I borrow a ladder? And then all of a sudden, everybody wants to come and bring me a ladder, except the last time and nobody had a ladder, which is weird. But like, so I'm coming up with reasons. I might have a hammer or a rubber mallet or whatever it is, but I will, I will go to my neighbor. Hey, do you, do you have this? I sure do. What else do you need, right? <clears throat> Just to get in there. Why? To be communal. To be communal. Christians, Christians are communal beings. Thirdly, Christians are Christ 
and cross dependent. We can't graduate from it. Like there is just no, hey, read the Bible in a year, check. Went to church that one time, Easter, three years ago, check. Right? We are Christ and cross dependent. And so now here's my question for you. Are you? Like, do you have, do you have people that you can take what is internal and bring it into the light as been talked about here? Do you have that? Do you have people that you can have those kinds of conversations with? Right, and, and I know what you're saying. I know what you're gonna say. Yeah, 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 my sister in Ohio. Yeah, we, we talk on a quarterly. Super important. And when things are tough, man, I talk to her. How often do you live life with her? Never. Well, quarterly. That's not what we're talking about here. That sounds more like a confessional booth, right, than communal life. No, I want this to weigh on us. I want us to feel the, the, the privilege of Christian community. That's why we see the idea here of fellowship four different times in this, when you have fellowship with one another. It's a triune God concept. We exist together. It's important. Life on life is important. In fact, the, we know why a lot of people leave the church or a lot of people will leave certain churches because that kind of experience, life on life, communal life together, confession and, and, and living with what is internal to being external, that is really, really messy. In fact, one of my dearest friend's wife, uh, we were at a concert just recently and, and we were just talking about what it looks like to do life and, and their, uh, their circles and I said, I man, how has it been? And she just said, you know, it's really hard to just be gracious when you sin against your dearest friends and when they sin against you <clears throat> and you're worshiping together. Oh, and you're also doing life together. Oh, and your kids are hanging out together. And I said, multi-generational sinning against each other. That sounds super messy. She's like, it is. It also sounds amazing, that kind of life. And so the takeaway from this passage, in my estimation, is this. <clears throat> For us to walk in the light as he is in the light, then there's some things that we get the privilege of doing, and that is to walk with one another. Walk with one another. And so if you are sitting here saying, I don't have anybody that I talk to like that, then begin to pray and ask God to develop spiritual friends to do so. It's a good thing. We don't have a marriage couple where we can hang out and talk like that. Okay, we'll begin to pray and begin to say, I, we need those kind of people. Praise God. Like, I don't know that I want to live life like that. That sounds scary. Yeah, okay. Well, let's pray then that God would give you the strength to follow his word, as we see in 1 John, that we together would walk in the light as he is in the light. Because God himself is light, truth. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Christ, we, we just thank you. We thank you that we don't graduate from the cross. We don't graduate from Christ. We don't move on from the scriptures. We don't move on from the saints. No, like food for the stomach. Like, like daily nutritional value, we as believers feast on the community, on your word, enjoying the merits and blessedness of confession. And so, Father, as we enter the time of the Lord's Supper, we thank you that if, if one not be a savior, then for him, uh, or if, if one not be a sinner, for him there be no savior we thank you that we can remember the cross that Jesus Christ bore for us. And so as we pause for a moment, the Bible says this, that to inspect your heart, inspect your heart before you approach the table, what does it mean? It just means to look inward and ask the question, is there someone to be reconciled with? Like as illustrated in the book of Matthew. Father, would you just, by your spirit, would you just provoke our thinking? Give us eyes to see what we don't see. Give us ears to hear what we might be trying not to hear.
We thank you. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray and ask this. Amen. On the night that Jesus was to be betrayed, he takes with his disciples, he takes the bread, and he breaks the bread, right, the matzah, and, um, and he, he gives it to each of the disciples. And remember, friends, we do this because that's what we're waiting for. We're waiting for the return of Jesus. We're waiting for Jesus to return for his church, and he will. And remember, he's not just returning for Lighthouse. He's returning for all the churches, right? He's, he's returning for those churches that herald Jesus Christ, that he is returning for those churches. That's why we pray for them, because they're waiting for the return of Jesus also, just like we are. And so he takes the bread and, and, and he breaks it and he says, take and eat my body broken for you. Church, let us remember. And in like manner, he takes the cup and he says, it is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Now, listen, guys, if, if you're not a Christian, like this whole concept and talk about community, it's going to fly right over your head. Like it's just going to put works on you. Then work. Like if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord, like if you've not yielded to him, if you've not seen him as Savior, access to God, oh, friends, you have a singular next step, which is to repent and believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord. He's the provision. He is the sacrifice needed for you to have relationship with God. Like, if you don't have that, then listen, community is downstream of that, I assure you, right? And that's why it's the new covenant. We're no longer slaughtering boats, uh, goats, bulls, lambs. No, the Bible records in, in Hebrews that he was the final sacrifice. God is satisfied. And so we celebrate that in this. So he says, take and drink my blood of the new covenant. Father, we thank you. Oh man, thank you. Thank you that you set it up where we cannot graduate from the cross. We cannot graduate from the scriptures. We cannot graduate from the saints. That's what we talk about in our new membership class. The, the scriptures, the spirit, the saints, so, Father, would you form in us a desire to walk in the light as he is in the light. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. We hope you've enjoyed today's message. For more information, visit our website at lighthousentx.com.